Clutter is a common trauma response, and it's not your fault. So instead of looking around and feeling shame, look around and imagine your space as a mirror of your inner world. It's a lot easier to have compassion that way, isn't it? After narcissistic abuse, everything feels scattered, and your emotions are all over the place. Is it any wonder your living space actually reflects that? It's kind of like the inner turmoil has spilled out into your surroundings. So you're not lazy or broken. You're coping. But don't let it overwhelm you. Your space can change as you heal. It is not permanent. It's just where you are right now. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Christina, and I'm a narcissistic abuse recovery coach. And if you can relate to what we're talking about here and can use some help sorting through the aftermath of a relationship with a narcissist, check out the link in the description for more on how I might be able to help. So we know that clutter can be a response to trauma. And in this video, we're talking about how we might be using clutter to hide what's really going on inside. So let's talk a little bit more about how clutter serves as a distraction. Because if you can identify with having a cluttered space, there's a good chance you also struggle with procrastination. So you might look around and see piles of unfinished tasks everywhere, a to-do list that never shrinks. You want to tackle it, but something holds you back. And you don't even know what that something is. It feels like you're being lazy, but it's actually something else entirely. It's avoidance. And this avoidance isn't even really about the tasks themselves. It's about what they represent. Each unfinished job is a reminder of the times you were told you weren't good enough. The clutter serves to reinforce that narrative, almost like physical evidence that it's true. But it's not. It's the echo of narcissistic abuse taking over. And your cluttered space creates a constant low-level stress. It's exhausting, but it's familiar. And after narcissistic abuse, familiar can feel safe, even when it's not healthy. But once you become aware of the problem, you don't need this clutter to validate your experiences. Your strength, your survival, it's all within you. The messy space externally, it's kind of like a physical reminder of what you've been through. And as you start to process your trauma, you might find it easier to face these tasks. Now, another way that clutter hides trauma is by serving as symbolic protection. So after narcissistic abuse, your clutter becomes more than just stuff. It's a shield. Those piles create physical barriers in your space, and they're like invisible walls keeping the world at arm's length. And if this is your comfort zone, it just feels safer this way. Your clutter hides things too. So personal items, memories, parts of yourself that you're not ready to share. When you have all that stuff surrounding you, it's hard to feel exposed. You feel kind of protected. It's kind of like how no one can see the real you if they can't get close enough. But it's not just about hiding. Your clutter is kind of like a time capsule too. It holds pieces of your past, of your identity. And letting go feels risky. What if you lose yourself in the process? So this stuff stays, and it's a buffer against uncertainty. Remember, we're drawn to the familiar. But we also have to acknowledge that the physical chaos keeps people at a distance. It's hard to get close to someone when there's no place to sit, right? So your clutter becomes a silent message that screams, keep out. It's lonelier this way, but it feels safer than risking more pain. And let's acknowledge once again, this is not about shame. And it's not your fault. Your clutter was a form of self-protection, but now it may be holding you back. After narcissistic abuse, clutter may also be your way of setting boundaries. Think about it this way. During the abuse, your personal space was invaded, your boundaries were trampled, and your autonomy was stripped away. Now the clutter serves kind of like an unintentional boundary. It's messy, yes, but it's yours. Every pile is a way to kind of say, this is my space. See, look at all my stuff right here. But here's the painful irony. This clutter that feels like protection is also suffocating you. I mean, think about it. How many times did the narcissist in your life dictate your choices, your style, your very being, but now your cluttered space is kind of doing the same thing? So maybe each item represents a piece of yourself that you're trying to hold on to, but then each item kind of gets buried or lost in the shuffle. Or maybe the clutter is filling the gap between who you were before the abuse and where you are now. Kind of like static that you can't quite see through. Like how you know those counters are there, but you can't quite picture them in a clutter-free space. 
If you're relating to all this, there's something I want you to know. Your value isn't measured by the state of your space. We really do gravitate towards the familiar. And even if it feels like this is within your control, there's a chance that in some small way, it's filling the role that the narcissist once had. So this clutter, it might feel like a boundary that's keeping you safe, but is it just a boundary that's keeping you from getting back to your authentic self? Is it the static that you can't quite see through? So another reason people struggle with clutter after a relationship with a narcissist has to do with controlling the chaos. So your cluttered space is absolutely going to seem chaotic to everyone else. But to you, it's kind of like a carefully crafted world. So every pile, every overstuffed drawer, it's part of your unique system. You know where everything is, for the most part anyway. So this apparent disorder, it's your form of order. It's a language only you speak. So when someone asks, how can you find anything in this mess? You might even feel a spark of pride because you can. This is your domain, your rules. But now think about this. During the abuse, your world was controlled by someone else. Now, this cluttered space, it's entirely yours. No one else can even navigate it. No one else wants to. And that, in a way, it gives you power and control over your own space. So this clutter kind of becomes like a fortress of solitude. It's a physical manifestation of your inner world. It's complex, it's layered, and it's only understood by you. So each item, it holds a piece of your story, and it's arranged in a way that makes sense to you and you alone. But here's where it gets tricky. This control you found in the chaos, it's a double-edged sword. It protects you, yes. It gives you a sense of ownership over your space and your life but it also isolates you. Part of you really craves this control and this uniqueness, and another part yearns for clarity, for a simpler way of being. It's like your mind and your environment are locked up in a really complex battle, each reflecting the other's struggle. But control isn't about keeping others out. It's about choosing who and what you let in. And as you heal, you might find yourself wanting to share your space, and yourself with others again. So another reason we might struggle with clutter after a relationship with a narcissist is that we're a little bit resistant to letting go. So think about that box of mementos that you can't bring yourself to sort through, or the clothes you never wear but you can't seem to donate. These aren't just things, they're anchors to your past, to who you were before the abuse, or who you were meant to be without the abuse. And letting go feels like losing a part of yourself. So your cluttered space mirrors your inner resistance to change. It's comfortable in its discomfort. You know it's not ideal, but again, it's familiar. And after the upheaval of narcissistic abuse, familiar feels safe, even when it's holding you back. And none of this is about stuff. If this is resonating with you, it's more about fear about fear of the unknown, and a desire to retreat to what is familiar and what is known. So the clutter kind of becomes like a security blanket, protecting you from uncertainty. But when you hold on to everything, you're not really making space for anything new to come into your life. And in a way, we've already talked about this, that is how clutter hides the pain. But it does so at a cost. Your space and your life become stagnant. You're surviving, but you probably wouldn't say that you're thriving. This trauma response, clutter, it's helping you get by, but you can think of it kind of like a band-aid. It's not a sustainable long-term solution. It's more like a defense mechanism. It's your mind's way of trying to protect you from more pain. But at some point, holding on does more harm than good. And letting go of clutter does not mean letting go of yourself. You are not your stuff. Your memories, your strength, your identity, they're all within you not in the things that are around you. And that old Marie Kondo way of decluttering is probably a good idea. I think she was onto something. We can appreciate things for what they are, and when they're no longer serving us, we can let them go. It's kind of like you're saying, I'm ready for what's next. And if you're feeling ready right now, I highly suggest watching the video that's about to pop up on the screen where I share five game-changing self-care practices you can implement today to begin rebuilding your self-worth after narcissistic abuse. But before you go, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.